Hey, welcome along. It's a great pleasure to have with me today my old boss. Uh, Conrad Black is the last man on earth who knew anything uh, about how to run a newspaper uh, until the corrupt and depraved US federal justice system uh, disgracefully took it all away from him. Uh, the great benefit of that was that it freed up time for Conrad to write books. He's uh, a terrific historian. He's written cracking biographies of Nixon and Roosevelt and two splendid one-volume histories of the United States and Canada. And his latest book is called The Canadian Manifesto, How One Frozen Country Can Save the World. But it's a great pleasure uh, to have uh, Conrad uh, with us. Now, I should say, you're, you're essentially an historian. You know huge amounts of uh, American history, British history, European history. And you begin this book, Conrad, with a, like a brisk uh, primer <laughs> on, uh, on, on Canadian history, virtually none of which anybody walking down Young Street in Toronto today would know a single fact about. I, I'm afraid that is true. But I, I think it's not confined to this country, Mark. Mm. I mean, I, when I was a young person, I have American cousins, and they, they always had an extremely nationalistic view of their history, but they knew a lot about it. They knew who the presidents would be, not just Washington and Jefferson, but virtually all of them. And that doesn't happen anymore, other than in some specialized schools. Americans don't know a thing about their history, and Canada is worse. At least America has the star systems, and it all, has always had it. And some of them, to be fair, are great stars, like Washington and Lincoln, and so on. Right. But, 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 so, so, the, so they have a sort of celebrity view of their own history. We didn't even have that. And now we're hurling muck at the founder of the country because he was supposedly nasty to the natives, which he wasn't, by the way. He gave them the right to vote. Right. And, and that in itself, we're destroying, our ignorance of history is leading us to destroy our history. So when, when you talk about uh, Sir John A. Macdonald, to most people now in his hometown of Kingston, he's just the guy who has to be taken off the name of the pub because he's such an appalling uh, racist and genocidal I, I, man. I went there to speak at the law faculty, urging them by... You know, a, a, you know, a speaking engagement formally arranged by invitation, urging them not to take his name off the law faculty. And there were people outside demonstrating, sing, singing some little ditty, uh, 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 denouncing John A. and me as Nazis, both of us. <laughs> so simply because you're defending... Uh, the founder of the country. <laughs> yeah, he's a Nazi, and so you must be a Nazi by association. That's what right. we've come to, yeah. yeah. What happens, though? because I, I read this, and it's, it's brilliant, you tell the story brilliantly, and uh, for non-Canadians, it's great, because you put what happened in Canada in the context of great power politics yeah. between France and Britain, and then with the emerging uh, American Republic and everything. But if you don't have a history, if you don't know your history, then do you have a country? Isn't it just like a giant parking lot of whoever happens to be uh, in it? <laughs> you, it you, you have it, but you can't realize it until you understand the history, and then you can make something out of it and engage. And you, you know uh, what's got you through to where you are if you know the history. Yeah. So you continue, the good parts of it, you continue. Yeah. And, and, and you're right. I mean, it, it's an asset. I mean, somebody seriously involved in running this country or any country has to know something about the history of the country. It's an odd formulation. Uh, you, you refer in the book uh, continuously to quote the Justin Trudeau government, unquote. And I, I, take it you're, I take it you're doing it to distinguish it from Trudeau Pair's ministry yes, uh, yes. some years back. Well, if you, if you say the Trudeau government in a historical context, it's yeah. ambiguous who you're talking about. Yeah. But it, it sort of gives the impression that he's, he's, it's not really, uh, it's not really his cabinet. It's a, he's a sort of label pasted on. Yeah, I, I didn't mean that, it, but he certainly it, it could hardly be more different from his father. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't think there was 
such a tremendous difference between John Adams and John Quincy Adams, or you know, the Grenvilles were both prime ministers of Britain, or the Pitts, you know, but they, but Pierre and Justin Trudeau were radically different people. And you knew Pierre. I knew him quite well. Quite well, because yeah. I always remember you saying uh, in some. Uh, Fest shrift uh, that you did, I think, for uh, Nancy Salvin, was it? I think she put together a book. Uh, she did, but I didn't contribute to that I thought, book. Well, yeah. whatever what it was you did contribute to, you said uh, that uh, Pierre was always very good company, except uh, perhaps not as ready as he might have been to reach for the check. Even when it was dinner. his invitation, he, 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 it, he was tighter than the paper on the wall. He was the <laughs> cheapest man I've ever met, yeah. although he was a well-to-do man, as you yeah. know. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, but uh, somewhat more uh, generous with uh, the uh, tax money. The, the public's money, yes. Yeah. Yeah. What's the... When you, when you uh, look back at the, the great sweep of... Uh, of Canadian history, which you do in, in the book. Um, with, with almost all the other dominions of the British Commonwealth, they are now today the leading regional powers in their corner of the world, whether you're talking about South Africa, Australia, mm -hmm. India. Uh, Canada suffers because it was next to another British-derived nation, that set a different course. Is that the central fact of Canada's history? It's the exact opposite to Australia. The Australians are, as a former prime minister of that country put it to me, we're 24 hours away from any country we have any similarity to of any size, leaving out New Zealand. And, and uh, here we have what Mr. King described to General de Gaulle as an overwhelming contiguity. So it's exactly the opposite. It's a great advantage to be so close to this most powerful country, which we, you know, there's plenty of room to criticize the Americans, but they're pretty good neighbors. I mean, considering the disparity in power between the two countries, they could swallow Canada whole, and they could have done it any time they wanted since the Civil War. Although for a while there would have been problems with Britain doing it, but they. Uh, but, but the point is they, ha they don't bother us, you know, and they, right. they never in a free trade agreement tried to meddle in this country the way uh, the, the, this ludicrous regime in Brussels meddled so much in Britain that the right. British finally told, you know, voted to get out. Uh, but on the other hand, we're always comparing ourselves to the Americans, and it's a difficult comparison. Well, you talk about, because your, your book includes uh, poli <coughs> your policy prescriptions, yes. which... Uh, I hope is a sign that you're uh, planning on <laughs> seeking the office of prime minister. But um, I, I wouldn't count on that. <laughs> <laughs> but you you talk about health care in which uh, uh, basic basically Americans have total contempt for the Canadian system yes. um, because it's the only other system of which they're aware. So when you propose reforms to American health care, people think it's uh, going to be like. Uh, uh, Canada, where you're going to be waiting. <laughs> but so one thing, all the Democrats and the Republicans can agree on, we don't want the Canadian system, right. and yet Canadians are so proud of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and at the same time, Canadians are terrified of the American. There was a story in the paper a couple of weeks ago where uh, some uh, old uh, fella, the family were down in Florida, and Grandpa was in the back seat and took a turn for the worse. And uh, they uh, they didn't want to go to a an American hospital because they assumed they'd be stuck with a quarter million dollar bill. Uh, so they headed straight back to Toronto, by which time, of course, the chap had been dead in the back seat for three <laughs> days. And they had difficulty explaining uh, it to Canadian. But, but that's basically how Canadians think of it, that if yeah. you... If you if you happen to uh, trip when you're on vacation in Florida, it's going to cost your house to be treated. So and, and not only that, if, if you're hit by a car, for argument's sake, mm -hmm. at Fifth Avenue and 57th mm -hmm. Street, the ambulance shows up and then says, well, let me see your credit card. If you don't have one, they say, well, top lock and drive off. Yeah. That, you know, they, yeah. It's just nonsense. What's your... So, in a sense, both both countries have a caricature of the other when it yeah. comes to healthcare. Yeah. What's your, what would be your preferred solution for for a, for a healthcare system for this country or for the Americans? Well, well, because you talk about your prescriptions here, but let's just say 
if you were if you were designing Conrad Blackistan from scratch, what kind of health care system would you be? Setting? We, we, we'd have frightfully healthy people. <laughs> uh, the uh, look, I I think essentially you you want a a a private system and encourage fiscally employers to to to, to provide health care as tax deductible expenses for their employees as the americans do uh and then a, a catastrophic health insurance plan for those of limited means and and the, it used to be said uh, even as recently as the 1960 presidential election in the U.S., they'd say, well, you want you, then you'll force people to take a pauper's oath. That was JFK's line with Nixon. And, and, and now everything is automated and mechanized, so you don't have to go through a pauper's oath. They, you know, the, the, the Canada Revenue computer says, this guy will have trouble paying his health bill, so he, you know, his uh, hospital bill for what he had. So you know, we'll top him up to this degree. So, I mean, basically, let the private sector do it. But for those who are financially endangered by health problems, you've got to insure them and make sure they get better service. But we've got to get more doctors. We have too few doctors per capita in this country. And and if, if we're still... If we still have long lines and waiting lists and so on, then I think we have to take part of the final phase of, of, of doctors being fully admitted to the profession and, and just add to it a few months where they voluntarily help in, in these things mm -hmm. and, then, and, and, and just make that part of their, of their professional formation before they're fully launched. Well, one of, one of the things you uh, talk about in your, in your book is you, you talk about Canada in relation um, to, its, to the two other uh, entities that have been most significant in its history, the United States and the United Kingdom. And, and also in places, France, I France, mentioned as yeah. well. But the US, the UK, and Canada all actually have pretty bad uh, doctor-patient ratios compared I, I, to... Uh, they do. Yeah, compare, I mean, absurd countries like Cuba, for example. Mm. Uh, but, but, uh, but also a number of the prominent Western European countries. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you've ever had a, any sort of occasion where you needed to get medical care in France or Germany, yeah, no. but it, it's wonderful. Yeah, no, I... I no, the, 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 France is an overtaxed country, yeah. but, but, but it certainly is a good system. What's, the, what's then the difference between... Uh, because, it, because in a sense, we have here in North America something that you don't have down in the Antipodes or elsewhere. Where you've had two uh, potential, you've had two divergent paths from Mother England, as it were. Uh, what's the difference in uh, in the nature of the the country, in the nature of the people, uh, south of the forty ninth parallel versus north? What you mean, the historical roots of it? Well, no, not not. But but, but there's there's something there's something uh, there must be something. Uh, es essential in the difference between yes. the two. Yes. The United States, look, all advanced countries have a mythos, mm. and the United States have a very powerful mythos. Now, a lot of it, in fact, historically is rubbish. Mm. Uh, but since it was the first country <clears throat> that, that, that didn't have a defined culture and language for itself, I mean, the Dutch speak Dutch, the mm. Spanish speak Spanish, and you know, and so forth. And they were a second English-speaking country, so they devised out of the rebellion against the imposition of the stamp tax, which, which the British were paying, and they were paying it largely to pay for expelling the French from North America. I mean, yeah. They doubled their national debt in the Seven Years' War and said, look here, you Americans are the wealthiest British people, so we want you to pay this tax too. And then Jefferson and the others devised this absolute fraud about no taxation without representation. I mean, nobody votes to tax themselves unless they have to have the money. And, you know, they'd already spent the money. The British had spent it. So the Americans told them to get lost and announced this was the beginning of human freedom. Now, at the end of the American Revolution, they had no more freedom than they had before. No more civil rights. They just had a resident government. 
but no more than, say, the Swiss had or the Dutch or the British. But that wasn't the point. We, th th this is a new order of the ages. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, said Jefferson, right. slaveholder as he was. And, and, uh, but, you know, it was nonsense, but it worked. But that, that's their tradition. Anyone can get anywhere if they work hard. And Canadians, you know, it, it was a string of, minor population centers along the U.S. border and and was put together by John A. Macdonald and his railway. Mm. And, and what they had was the French fact and the British connection. And then they constructed this thing that, uh, you know, peace order, good government, kinder and gentler, we're peacekeepers in the world. Mm. And it was, it was essentially, even, even if not consciously, a self-definition to distinguish us from the Americans. And is it and, and that's largely nonsense too. We have no absolutely no aptitude as peacemakers any more than anyone else does. No, no. And in fact, uh, if you'd been, uh, say, traveling by train uh, across North America in the late 1930s, you might well have concluded that Canada was the more militaristic power. You would have seen more soldiers at Canadian uh, railway stations. Yeah. Like uh, yeah. No. And, and look, as you know, as the old line goes. Uh, if you if you have peace, you don't need peacekeepers, and if you have war, they're no use to you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> now tell me something, because you know uh, almost all the most prominent Americans uh, since uh, since the end of the Second World War, and your line that basically uh, the British did the American colonists a favor by throwing the French out of North America, mm -hmm. and then decided that. It's not unreasonable that the Americans should make some kind of financial contribution as they were the beneficiaries of that deal. Right. Uh, do you ever say that to Henry Kissinger? And oh, he, well, he's, you know, he, he's, he came to the United States at the age of 15, and he's a cynical European anyway. And like most members of the rabbinical persuasion, he's not a raving optimist. So he, the, no, no, uh, imputation of cynical motives would surprise him, no matter who the party was that you're referring to. But uh, no, I, I, I do, and I also say to them, no, I want to be clear, Mark, the American, they had a good argument and they handled it well, and, and, and they, were, they were great men who founded the United States. But, uh, and it's, of course, it's a great nation. It's been, there's never been anything like the rise of America. Right. And, and we chiefly owe to them the spread of democracy and the free market economy in the world. But, uh, so I, I'm not an anti-American, but the, um, what I do say is if they, if they had just not revolted, made their point about taxes without, uh, I mean, if you read the Declaration of Independence, Jefferson's denunciation of poor old George III makes him sound like a defendant at Nuremberg, you know? You're, you're a fan of George III. And not really, but I, he's, he's, he wasn't a bad man. He was a bit limited, but he wasn't a bad man. But Farmer George, but the, but the um, uh, uh, what, what I was going to say was that uh, if they had just stayed, they would have taken over the whole thing before the Civil War, and there wouldn't have been a Civil War. They lit, the, 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 the United States as we know it would have become more important in the British Empire than the British Isles were. Mm. The Irish would have sided with the Americans anyway, and, and of course a great many of them moved to the United States, yeah. and the United States by the end of the 19th century would have controlled would have controlled all of it, all of India, half of Africa, Canada, Australia, Britain, no. the United States, all of it. Because you're saying that, uh, that it would have become the United States of North America. It, it, no, the, it, it was the British and American Empire, or something like that. Yeah, and, and and at some point the capital would move from London to Washington. Well, you'd leave the king in London, but the capital, the political capital, would be in I guess in New York or Philadelphia. Right, yeah. right. This, this sounds like one of those uh, alternative history. Yes, uh, yeah, well, it, it, it's, it, it's completely irrelevant. It just happens to be no, the case. What, what, what's interesting? But, you know, Franklin said, you know, we're going to pass the British in population in the 1840s, and that's right. exactly what happened. Right. Well, what, to, to, to go back to what you were saying about um, <clears throat> the founding myth, as it were, um, which which uh, you, you, you say it's it's... 
nonsense. But in a sense, even if it is nonsense, isn't it a, a kind of necessary? Yes, nonsense? and isn't it's it? brilliant. Oh, it's good. Yeah, yeah. No, it works, of course. Yeah. I mean, the fact that it's not altogether accurate is neither here nor there. Look, all these countries have it. The French still think they're by far the greatest civilization in the world. Well, they're very distinguished civilization without doubt, but they have no standing to say that. The British think that they're by far the wisest and the, when you get right down to it, you know, we're, we're God's gentlemen and the rest are just, you know, they're here and there, but that's sort of just who they are, you know? And, and, and I mean, it, 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 all serious nationalities have their own ideas of themselves. And you, like people, you'd have to have some kind of a positive self-image or you're not gonna get anywhere. Yes, yes. And no, I, 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 I'm for it, but, we, but there, it's, there's a two-track approach. The history is different, but the fact is what it is. But isn't there then a problem for somewhere like Canada and to a certain extent Australia and elsewhere is that if you don't have uh, like a declaration of independence, if you don't have a 4th of July, if you just get uh, a little bit of self-government and then you get some more and uh, then you find you're sitting in the second row of seats at the Versailles Conference and then you have a, a statue to Westminster and it's all sort of gradual mm. and amorphous. Uh, you don't have a great central defining myth. Uh, you, and you don't have a heroic revolutionary tradition. Mm. You, you, it was endless trips to, to, to London mm. to ask the British for, uh, to give us what other, our English speaking cousins had in Britain yeah. and America. Uh, we, we, uh, but, but with the added difficulty that those who did it, the Canadians who did it, Baldwin and Lafontaine, and particularly MacDonald and Cartier and the others at the founding of Confederation, they couldn't say, as, as basically Franklin did when he represented Pennsylvania and some other states in, in London prior to the American Revolution, give us what we want or we're going to leave, mm. because it, it, the British knew that if we if we said we're leaving, we'd be swallowed whole by the Americans. So right. we couldn't say it. And that's that's what makes, in my opinion, McDonald's achievement even more astonishing. He, we had to have a ludicrous Gilbert and Sullivan rebellion here yeah. of Mackenzie and Papineau, you know, a bunch of drunkards in a bar up north of here, and a, a few French Canadian intellectuals remonstrating and absurdly pompous flourishes as if they were Robespierre well, and Danton or something. Well, you, you, you <laughs> say, which I never really thought of it as that, that the, uh, the, 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 that period is basically Canada's contribution to the European revolutions of 1848. 1848. We, yeah. we, got, we got a responsible government. Yeah. The French brought back the Bonapartes. The Metternich was thrown out of office. All sorts of great things yeah. happened over. That's what we did, you yeah. see. But, 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 what, but what I was going to say is that we, we, you know, we had to have a minor rebellion to get their attention. It, didn't, it, had, it, it, didn't, it had to be not so irritating to the British that they, that they called in the American minister and said, look here, you can have Canada just give us a, an absolute guarantee of joint ownership of the Isthmian Canal, the Panama Canal, when you build it, now, or something that, like that. When you, is that actually uh, uh, an historical fact, that, that London would have been willing to give uh, America Canada in return for co-ownership of the Panama Canal. It's speculation by me. We don't know that. But the, the, the Webster-Ashburton Treaty, Daniel Webster, mm. who was the Secretary yeah, of State twice, you, you know. And, and, of course, mm. of course he was. And, and, uh, and it, 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 part of that treaty r refers to the, if they build a canal, the British would, would their ships yeah. could go through it. But, uh, but it's just speculation by me, but the point is the Americans could have offered them something that, that would have been tempting to Britain. And let's say they, let's say they, uh, I mean, I, I'm not exactly sure what it might be, but they, they could make an offer, even if it was just money, even if they yeah. bought it. Uh, because the, the British weren't terribly interested in, Can in Canada. They, they worked themselves up to a bit of interest when Gray was prime minister because he, he, he was sort of a, uh, you know, an empire free trade person. Yeah. Yeah. Forerunner of Joseph Chamberlain. You were uh, in one of your uh, in in uh, something uh, of a deal that uh, has the vague uh, 
kind of uh, association with that uh, Canada for Panama thing. You propose towards the end of your book that Canada take over the British West Indies. Well, we, it was offered to us, you know, at the end of World War One, and Borden said, "No dice. We don't want it." Hmm. Borden was our prime minister, yeah. and and I know that. Can you don't say no, that. no, no. I know, but it, it, possibly not all your Sir viewers Robert would. Borden. <laughs> yeah, well, he, he, who, minister of Canada, who was kept his place on the hundred dollar bill. Yeah. Uh, 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 and, but the, but the no, uh, no, no, I, no, I, no, I, I, Mark, I knew, I know you knew, yeah. but I didn't know that your viewers would know necessarily. But but the but he the the Lloyd George said you you can have the West Indies if you want it. He said, no, what do we want the West Indies for? Yeah. But which then, which is weird to me because Australia wound up with places like uh, Papua New Guinea. Yes, uh, even New Zealand has uh, the Cook Islands and so forth. Yeah, uh, that was clearly in the air in London at the end of the uh, Great War. That uh, that if if you uh, accept the idea. That the dominions are equal in stature to the United Kingdom, then why don't they run all the local colonies? Exactly. Why, why did Canada? Well, and even with South Africa, actually, with German Southwest Africa. So, so why did given to, given to South Africa? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So why is it that Canada alone decided that Canada didn't want to be in the colonial? Business? That that's that's a good thesis topic for some doctoral candidate. I mean, it's an interesting question, but I, I mean, I think Borden just thought they would be a nuisance. I, I now. I, as you know, the racial pigmentational distinctions in those days were, uh, were were paid greater attention than they are now. But uh, and and it's the change is a good one. But I, I have no standing to impute that as a motive to Borden. But it wouldn't surprise me. But we could have done a lot with those islands. You've revived that idea because you you say en passant that. Substantial numbers of Canadians spend uh, half the year in Florida and Arizona and basically spend half their annual income down there. And they could be doing that if Canada was running um, St. Kitts or uh, the Turks and Caicos or Bermuda, they could be spending that other half of their income on Canadian soil and benefiting the Canadian economy. Look, I suspect if it was pitched right, you could, you could even though they're independent countries, you know, Bahamas, Barbados, Trinidad, yeah. those five little ones, you know, so Dominica and Grenada yeah. and so on, and uh, <clears> even <throat> I, I Jamaica, although that's a little more problematical. But I, I think they'd all come in if we if we invited them. Now, there would be certain questions about that, but also, if if you if the you know Quebec is so concerned about the linguistic balance, we could arrange something with Haiti. You you can't just have the arrival of millions of Haitians in Canada, uh, you know, fitting them out with tukes and gloves to acclimatize them, uh, and you know, sending them. Yeah. But we could do more with the Caribbean. You know, we don't we don't have to have federal union with all of them, but we could do a lot more. So you them. you've got your eye on the French West Indies too. Well, not France is not going anywhere. If, no, if, if, if we that. touched Guadeloupe or Martinique, we'd, yeah. we'd, we'd have you know French nuclear submarines in the Saint Lawrence. Uh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> just to reassure, I like the way. By the way, the book is uh, the book is a, a brilliant mix of things that you can uh, conceive of. Uh, uh, the uh, the present uh, terribly. Uh, not terribly uh, rock-ribbed Conservative Party going along with, and mm -hmm. then things that they would just be, those <laughs> jelly-spied losers would just be all paralysed yeah, over exactly. because they would be Shaking in their shoes. Yeah, huh? <laughs> uh, that it would not focus group terribly well. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, have, uh, you have some other uh, 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 robustly expressed ideas. We, we had in Canada the sesquicentennial uh, a couple of years ago, yes. and it was, and it's got to be accounted the biggest flop of all time, particularly for anyone who was around during the centennial. And one reason why it was a flop and why it was a total downer uh, and a joyless, thankless, miserable thing, uh, <laughs> particularly on July the 1st at Parliament Hill, is because... Uh, for some reason, everyone, uh, every official, the, the, the Governor General and the Prime Minister and the Deputy Assistant Minister of Fisheries, whenever they're beginning a speech now, they, they have to say, we, we, 
we stand here on the ancient land of them, and then they invent some Indian tribe that you've never heard of, no. and uh, whether or not they actually exist, they could, it could all just be a giant leg ball. What is it with it, it, it this? It all looks like a Monty Python thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, what is it with this so-called Aboriginal... Be, be, before you can have a cup of tea at uh, Rideau Hall or 24 Sussex Drive, the Governor-General or the Prime Minister has to acknowledge that we stand here on some land that we stole from some guys half a millennium back. What, what's that about? nonsense. Well, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not the right person to explain the logic of that policy, but as, uh, the fact is... If this trend continues, we're working up to, and you can hear it from some of the more radical native leaders, mm. the theory that this was a populated country, the Europeans arrived, mm. invaded it, and occupied mm. a foreign country mm. uh, in, in a way that is qualitatively undistinguishable mm. from what Hitler and Stalin did to Poland. Yeah. Well, there were 200,000 so-called Indians, I mean, so-called by us at the time, Indians in, in all of what is now Canada. Mm. And, they, and they were nomads. They were almost all nomads, and they weren't occupying the country. No. And it wasn't an invasion at all. And, and I, look, I, I, I have absolutely nothing but regard for the Native people, and, and, and I think we've made a lot of mistakes in our policies in that area and have to do better. But... The idea that, that they were an equivalent civilization is nonsense. Sorry, they're equivalent people, of course, but they hadn't invented the wheel. It was a Stone Age culture. They had no fabrics, no knitting. They had no tools other than animal bones. And they had almost no permanent structures no. and almost no agriculture. And and whatever, in goodness knows, Europe was a rough place in the 15th and 16th, 17th centuries, but but it was the culture of Shakespeare and and uh, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, mm -hmm. Descartes, and Montaigne, mm -hmm. and others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and and the, the the native people here were five thousand years behind the Europeans. But but you sense when they do all this that it's not really about uh, it's not really about. Uh, kissing up to the first peoples at so much as denigrating uh, the the uh, Western European state uh, on this continent. Well, this is the incongruity of it. It is a denigration of our own presence here. And if they're going to denigrate that, what are they doing holding these pompous offices like governor general and so forth? Mm. I mean, if they feel that strongly about it, why don't they just... I mean, yeah. and I, I know, an we, we can't of, be far uh, away yeah. from when the one of the many eight, uh, the, the six or eight hundred or whatever it is, clans or tribes that we have yeah. to treat as a fellow nation on yeah. a basis of equality. The present prime minister tells us so, says, "Well, look, all of you, pack up and get out. Leave everything you built, but yeah. out, all of you. Yeah. yeah, go back where you came yeah. from. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> but that's what we're inviting, and and, and so it, it's a kind of it's a it, it's a." It's a self-administered psychiatric blackmail. It's the most astonishing um, demonstration. If you just leave people completely undisturbed in possession of something, they eventually become guilty about uh, holding it and reproach themselves more and more uh -huh. severely. And ultimately, um, if the present trend continues, somebody in the NDP probably will get to his or her feet and announce that we, we should all face up to it and just leave. Yeah, because it's... I mean, it's just like this call no, for reparations to the African-Americans yeah. in the United States. You know, it's just nonsense. Which was a nutso idea a decade ago yeah. and then suddenly became mainstream. It has been virtually embraced by the party of Jefferson Jackson, yeah. Yeah. you know, who yeah. tore up the Indian treaties. And then, yeah. and then when the Chief Justice John Marshall told him it was illegal what he'd done, said, well, you've made your decision, now try and enforce right, it. Right, right. <laughs> Actually, I wouldn't mind seeing. Uh, well, you you're very uh, you have a very low opinion of the justice system on both sides of the border. Wouldn't you mind seeing a few politicians actually uh, telling uh, judges, "Yeah, well, what are you going to do about it?" Yeah, uh, we can't we can't have government by judges, but to a degree, the Charter of Rights has inflicted that on mm. us. You know, mm. okay. I mean, the, the the whole concept of the High Court of Parliament has gone up the chimney. Yeah. That this is just a talking shop, and every judge in Canada makes it up as he goes along. No, abs absolutely, and uh, and 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 they don't care about the 
pretzel logic they have to use to, to, to twist the plain meaning of language into achieving. Look, my, my dear friend, Rosie Bell, and she is, she's a lovely person, been a friend for nearly 40 years. Uh, but she wrote the opinion for the majority a couple of years ago that the right of assembly in the Charter of Rights permitted the employees of the government of Saskatchewan in designated essential services mm. to go on strike, mm. whatever the government of Saskatchewan thought of it. Now, yeah. what has that got to do with the right of assembly? Yeah. And this is what we're coming to. Yeah. It's yeah. just nonsense. It's gibberish. Yeah. 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 It's a, it's a, it, it, you, you have some, uh, that, you have some constitutional prescriptions at the end of this book. And the one that uh, is perhaps the most jaw-dropping uh, for, for some of Surely us. Surely not. <laughs> uh, is that you, um, you're proposing, and try, try and ex, uh, you're proposing that Canada become a kind of a simultaneous kingdom and republic. Yes. That, that, that Her Majesty the Queen would share the position of head of state. Yes. With a, essentially a French style president. In other words, not yes. just a governor general with a new name. Yeah. But a, a, a president that has uh, the same kind of powers, particularly in international affairs, as the French president. A, a little less, but mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. I, I think a ceremonious chief of state, an entirely ceremonious chief of state, unless it is a monarchy, it doesn't work because you, you, you end up with sort of, at least intermittently, decayed servitors in Cromwellian terms in that job. I mean, in Germany and Italy, they often have distinguished presidents, but they're stand-ins for mm -hmm. deposed monarchs. Absolutely. I, I, I believe the chief of state, as in France and the United States, has to be a, ser a, a serious person in the sense of serious powers. Uh, and I, the French model works better for us because the prime minister functions rather like our prime minister does. Mm -hmm. And and uh, it, it, but but it, it, but uh, uh, my idea is of a president and governor general, same person in Canada would would have less powers than the president of France, but a little like that. Some uh, and would be ultimately answerable to Parliament. We we have to have that. But it would be an elected official, so it would be a democracy. But I'm trying to save a, half a loaf for the monarchists because I think. In the first place, I have nothing but admiration for the Queen, but and and, and most of the recent uh, monarchs. But they, I mean, British monarchs, British Canadian monarchs. But they, the, um, I, I think a, a hereditary non-residential chief of state ultimately is not going to work. So, well, we, so we have to finesse it. Well, you're finessing, and and there's a lot of finessing. In uh, imperial history. And uh, in Canadian history. No, I, I, and I take that point. I think uh, De Valera, uh, when he uh, revised the Irish constitution in 1936, had, uh, had a, a bizarre con uh, compromise where there was a so-called president who functioned as a president within the boundaries of the state but His Majesty the King signed all the letters of accreditation for foreign diplomats and represented the state abroad. And you can, you can, if you have as as kind of malevolently inventive a mind as De Valera, you can yes, square yeah. that circle. Yeah. But um, uh, wouldn't wouldn't you just be unraveling the entire Canadian state if you were to propose? Uh, if you were to attempt to implement something, I don't think so. I think we'd we'd just be modifying a little part of it. Uh, I know, I, and that's that's not my intention. I think we have, and I write there. I think we've been very successful politically. I mean, the only countries in the world with a bigger population than ours, as big or bigger, who have had the same political institutions for longer than we have are the British and Americans. Mm. And at that, the British lost a big province in Ireland. Yes. And the Americans had just, when we set up Confederation, had just finished a terrible civil war. So I think we have a fine record of continuity, and I want to continue that. But you can you can modify your institutions. But, you, but your basic thing is that the non-residency of the Queen... <clears throat> is an issue that you can't keep ducking. Uh, the non-residency, the increasing evidence of the fact that it is a different country, maybe not a completely foreign country, but a different country, uh, and, and the undemocratic nature of a monarchy. 
Uh, but so we keep it, but we make it, as I said, a co-chief why, why, if the residency is, an, why, why couldn't you just, I mean, uh, according to the Daily Mail, uh, Buckingham Palace is eager to offload Harry and Meghan because they feel she's a loose cannon. Why couldn't you just have Look, I, I the remember. second son of the sovereign come and take a residence in the senior division? No, that, that could be done. And I, when I used to when I was a newspaper owner in London, I used to see the then Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, quite often. She would always say, look, for heaven's sakes, don't discourage the royals from going to Canada. Mm. We, we can't have them here all the time, you know, and we need someone to share the cost of them. <laughs> right, 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 exactly. It's a big family, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and there were a lot of its realms that it could be spending more time yeah, in. Yeah. Why, why doesn't that... I mean, what's odd to me is that the, the royal family, in a sense, has become more parochial since the development of the international air travel and the jet age. Yeah, for a time, the Queen herself got around much better than her father had, for the reason you said. But, um, uh, but, all, but I, I think it's because they're concerned about, uh, you know, a, 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 about independent sentiment in... Mm. In, in, in different countries, and and uh, I, I, I want to be clear, they they have a very difficult role, even in Britain, let alone here. And I think they do it very well. I'm I'm mm. not I'm not a critic of the royal family at all, mm. and I I know most of the members of it, and and I th I think it's uh, no I th I think they've done awfully awfully well in a very difficult position. I want I want to ask you something about culture. Because <laughs> uh, may I just say one thing? Yeah. I do make the point. I think I made the point in there. Napoleon's last regime, when he came yeah. back from Elba, it, he, it was an absolutely democratic system he set up. Yeah. And, and he called it, he, 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 it was the second empire of the Republic of France. Right. So, I, I mean, Napoleon is a precedent for mixing uh, no, a royal I, system I, and a republic. And system. I think if you go back even before that, the French philosophers like Montaigne always considered England a crowned republic. And I noticed that uh, Sir David Smith, who was the long time the Queen's longtime private secretary in Australia and to the Governors General down there, uh, always uh, liked to use the phrase uh, during the Republican debates in Australia that Australia was a crowned republic, as it were. That the that is the a Commonwealth of Australia. That is a uh, a valid. Uh, valid concept. Look, uh, General de Gaulle resolved the ancient quarrel between the monarchists and the republicans by creating a monarchy and calling it a republic. Well, but he ruled like a yeah, king. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Anyway, I interrupted you. So. No, I, I want to talk about the culture aspects of this because um, you want Canada to be a great country. Yes. And and that's difficult because it's it's next to the hyper, and, and we're the third English-speaking country and the second French-speaking country. Yes. So we don't have a language of our own. Although no, but, we, we have people who, who no, but, and I think you perform argued, well in those languages. You, you could have argued that in when they set up the UN Security Council in 1945, that Canada had done enough heavy lifting to get a place on that, but that you couldn't have a third English-speaking country. Uh, as part of the permanent members of the Security Council. So in a sense, Canada, Canada suffers always by, by, by simply uh, the, the fact that it's another English uh, Except when the G5 wanted to add Italy and the mm. Americans and Japanese said, look here, we're not going to be swamped by the Europeans, we want Canada. Right. Yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> but let, let, me, let me ask you about... about one of the other characteristics of great nations, uh, because you you say you, you talk about uh, the social democracies of Scandinavia, and you make the point that they they've got very tiny populations. Yet every so often they produce a Grieg or an Ibsen or a Sibelius, um, and you want to and 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 you want Canada to have that top tier uh, kind of cultural impact. Uh, whereas the reality is that people who are that good now uh, tend to leave for Los Angeles or New York or London or Paris. That has been the history of Canada. I think as we as our scale increases, we'll, we'll, we will retain more such people. And as the composition of the population becomes, and it's with great 
trepidation, I use this terribly abused word, m more diverse, uh, I, I, I think the self-confidence of the population rises and, and, and we become, I, I think we'll gradually have more highly talented people who remain in the country. But what you said has certainly historically been a problem, yes. You, 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 you call for uh, doubling down, as it were, on institutions like the National Film Board. It, it, but running the them CBC. differently. Yeah, yeah, running them differently. But I remember, uh, I think this was in your autobiography, uh, you had a, 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 like a very funny line in there. Uh, where, I can't remember what you were talking about, but you said something, it's a bit like Canadian art, which loses 90% of its value the minute you take it across the border. You, 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 except for a couple of abstract artists, mm. French Canadians, mm. you, you can't sell Canadian art outside Canada. No, no, yeah. it, 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 its value evaporates <laughs> yeah. the, the minute you take it anywhere else. But isn't, isn't that what you, uh, in a sense, we wind up with, uh, excepting perhaps pop music and Celine Dion and so forth, isn't that what we end up with now, is that, is that the, the terrible, pitiful boosterism when you listen to yeah. the CBC interviewing a Canadian novelist? Uh, uh, often, yes. I'm afraid it is, instead of being something that nurtures some, things that are exceptionally good and people who are exceptionally talented, it tends to become cliquish, protectionist, and, and, and a, 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 a glass and hard metal, the thickness of the armor on an Iowa-class mm. battleship mm. sealing for mediocre people. Right, right, yeah. Absol absolutely. And I, I wonder... Uh, because, you, you, like, our, our, our old friend Mordecai Richler... And, Should have had the Nobel Prize. Yes, and he... Uh, uh, and to a certain extent, um, uh, I, I got kind of irked when he died and he was uh, present... Because a novelist is a novelist, mm -hmm. and you, you may... Nobody... Nobody reads Dickens because he's English. They read not. Dickens because he's Dickens. Right. Um, and I wonder if that is... Uh, I understand that great cultural figures are part of what it makes a great nation. But if the sort the, the chippy nationalism that, that gets into play when you have a bureaucracy... And, uh, 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 that's, uh, I, I'm as opposed to that as you are. Mm. But, but in what you said applies to American writers, too. I mean, Walt Whitman was very distinctively American, but Ernest Hemingway and mm. F. Scott Fitzgerald largely wrote about Europe, but they're yeah, no so less American Henry James, for that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but uh, just to go back to that word that sort of sat rather oddly in your gullet as a final thought, Conrad, because I'm... <laughs> Uh, you, you've, you were an early supporter, uh, or at least you saw where the Trump campaign could go in the United States. And, and uh, the core of the Trump platform, when he, when he took off and when he came down the escalator, and he started saying that Mexico isn't sending its best, and uh, the, un the loss of control of borders and mass immigration was a core Trump issue. Yes. He was going to build a wall. Mexico was going to pay for it. And it remains a core issue for his supporters. Now we have Conrad Black uh, using the word diversity. And you haven't said <laughs> with, with great caution. You haven't said multicultural yet. But, no, 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 uh, no, no. Quite no. well. No, yeah, but not in <laughs> kindly terms. <laughs> uh, can it... You say immigration is necessary simply because of the disparity between Canada's population and America's. Mm. Uh, can uh, we, we? It's much quicker to get to to land in this country and get to the top than it is in America. I mean, we have a essentially a, a Somali who became um, Mr. Trudeau's uh, defense minister, um, and. Uh, we uh, and you can get there in j just a few years from landing to sitting in the cabinet. Um, can anyone become a Canadian? And does any country, given automation and all the rest of it, need mass immigration on the Canadian scale these days? We need more people. Uh, I, I think I think we should um, 
make sure that we're, we're doing our best to bring in the most easily assimilable ones, not exclusively so, but in, in substantial numbers. Uh, just not not because people from other places are inferior. It's just a matter of what's uh, what suits the national convenience. That's all. Um, and and by the way, in fairness to the Americans, you know, uh, they were a long way ahead of us in the elevation of such eminent figures as we'll start with Albert Gallatin, for example, mm -hmm. but but more recently uh, as big Brzezinski, a Polish Canadian, yeah. and and Henry Kissinger, whom you mentioned, yeah. who was uh, you know only arrived when he was fifteen years old, yeah. uh, and and um, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a good thing, hmm. and and, and uh, but my point is we 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 have to maintain and if possible reduce the ratio po population and and uh, uh, ancillary ratios mm -hmm. like GDP and so on between the US and Canada in order to get any significance for ourselves but also you need a certain critical mass to be a country that 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 has mm -hmm. that, that that has a a, a broad culture mm -hmm. and and a, a broad civic base mm -hmm. you just can't i mean you can you know specialist countries like you know tax haven countries like Luxembourg or Monaco or right. something are fine or petro states like Kuwait or something might be all right, but that, but if you want to be one of the world's important countries, we need more people than we've got. So not, not, we don't need 200 million people, we need more than we've got. Okay. And, and I saw, I think it was in the Globe and Mail today, somebody talking about Canada having a population of 100 million by the end of the century. Do you, can uh, you imagine? Uh, I'm not well, sure I story. can. It's like, <laughs> Okay. I mean, you know, Kenora, Ontario will be a city of a million people. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Look, I am always amazed when I go out into the countryside around Toronto and see, you know, Milton with a population of 70,000. I remember we used to drive pa through Ajax and yeah. we'd make the joke, Ajax, the foaming village, you know, after right, that cleanser. Right, right. And they had about 5,000 people. Or I think there's 70,000 people there now or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I wonder. I'll be interested in that. It's a bit like when uh, you people, uh, these cruises on the Mexican Riviera, and in the brochure it sounds like a charming fishing village with a subdivision, and you get there and it's an industrial city of 30 billion people that nobody's <laughs> ever heard of. I'm a bit... <laughs> I'm not. I'm not sure. <laughs> I, uh, I quite buy into the mass population. No, no, I, no. I, I, I don't mean. I don't mean. Uh, you know, a vast population. Yeah, I just mean yeah. more than what yeah. we have. Well, uh, uh, something the size of France or Britain is fine. You know, fifty yeah, or sixty yeah. million people. That's fine. We don't yeah. need more than that. We well, all. The, the great thing about uh, you, Conrad, <laughs> is you. Because people, which must be frustrating to you, because you're. You're, you're pinned in Canadian terms as some kind of right-wing figure, and yet you have a tremendous generosity of spirit, uh, sometimes quite alarming to those of us on the far extreme insane right, uh, about a lot of, 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 uh, of, of uh, government intervention, and, uh, and you're more, you have a more greater generosity of spirit to the liberal project for Canada. Yeah, well, you see, I think it's, I wouldn't if I was an American because mm. the private sector can manage almost anything yeah, in that yeah. country. But in this country, we have, we've had to have a public sector participation to get anything done. It started with Jean Talon. Right. He founded most of the industries yeah. and he brought in these thousand new bile young ladies from whom six million French Canadians and Franco Americans are now descended. Yes, I, I know you have that statistic in the book. It's like uh, because the, the, the French essentially sent uh, hunters and fishers. Uh, they sent men. Or, or, or scoundrels. Yeah, yeah, they sent men to the New World, and then they realized that uh, the uh, English, uh, Scots, and Irish were also accompanied by young ladies. Yeah. And so they had to <laughs> have an emergency importation of uh, nubile maidenhood, as yes. you put it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which certainly did the trick. How many, how many are descended from those thousands? Six million. 
Six million. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but you, you don't know, need it, immigration it, if... Uh, but look, <laughs> it was, it was C.D. Howe was not there. Look, the CPR. Mm. It, 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 you, you, people don't realize it wasn't like the American transcontinental railways where they're just building across the Great Plains until yeah. they got to the mountains. Rocky Mountains. Yeah. I mean, we had to, the Canadian Shield north no, north, no, north no. of Lake Superior. It's a terrible place to build a railway, you no. know. And we had no capital markets, mm -hmm. so we had to get the money elsewhere. Yeah. And then the British, the Americans wanted us to go bankrupt. They didn't want another transcontinental yeah. railway, yeah. and the British thought it was all nonsense anyway. Yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> uh, that's, uh, that's the quandary. Well, yeah, uh, and remember, the, Mr. Gladstone, four-term prime minister, thought the empire was nonsense. He thought it was all nonsense. He thought it was a trick of Disraelis to yeah. mystify the British with a lot of rubbish about power overseas, you know? Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, and here we are, uh, best part of 150 years later, uh, living with the consequences of that. Your, <laughs> your, your books always, uh, you always have some, in, and I said, this whole Royal Republic of Canada yeah. that you're preparing, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure how uh, the Pakeists in Quebec City are going to feel about it. No. There's all many facets, but the great thing about it, Conrad, is there's always great things uh, to ponder in what you write. And it's Thanks so much, Mark. By the way, I didn't write the subtitle. No, I, I about know the that. frozen country. That was that was our friend Ken, the publisher. <laughs> I know, I know. It's one it's one of the curses of writing books that the publisher always writes the subtitle. Yeah. It's, uh, it's <laughs> an interesting thing. But it's a great book, uh, the Canadian Manifesto. You can that's you can read it in ninety minutes. That's Conrad's contribution. The how one frozen uh, country can save the world. That's his publisher's contribution. But the Conrad stuff in the book is cracking. Uh, and you should pick up a copy. Thanks a lot, Conrad. Thank, thank you, Mark. Lovely thank to you. see you.